So I want to share a word, it's called the good fight. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse one says, David, the son of Jesse declared, go to verse eight, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. I love sometimes just reading the names because when you read the names, you understand what was behind it. The first one is called Adino the Esnite. Now this is not his birth name and this is not where he came from. When you look up in the Jewish history area, this is a name that David gave this name. The very word Adina, and you've got to hang on because it, it can sound uh, uh, area. It's, it goes, the very word Adina means plant like a worm, okay? So plant means humble or, or giving or give way like a worm. Are you telling me that David calls one of his mighty men like a worm? Malinga's like a worm. He doesn't mean like that, but he means he was modest and humble. So that's how it came out. He was humble. And the second name that he gave him, the Esnite means a man who is strong as a tree. So when you put it together, when David called his name, he says, he is a man who is modest and at the same time as strong as a tree. That's what David was saying. And it says here, and he uh, killed 800 uh, by him at one time. Verse nine, and after him was Eliza, uh, which means God has helped the son of Dodo, not from New Zealand, those birds went extinct, okay? But Eliza, the son of Dodo, the Ararite, which is from Benjamin, one of the three mighty men with David. Verse 10, he rose up and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and it clung. It's like it melted to the sword. It was in a spasm. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder the dead. I mean, the others left them. Though no, none would follow, yet, yet none would go with me, still I will follow, no turning back. And he did that on his own. Verse 11, now after him was Shema, the son of Agi, a Harite. And a Harite means uh, 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 from the hill of Judah, the hill people of Judah. And it literally means a mountaineer, okay? So these are the mountain people, okay, of Judah. And the word Shema, well, we know it, Shema means present. Okay, Yahweh Shema means God is present. So by the word Shema, David is saying, this man is always there. He's dependable, he's present. Isn't that good? Is there anyone here called Shema? Good, there are some people, others have got their head down, but you can change that, okay? Verse 12, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot and he defended it and he struck the Philistines and the Lord brought about a great victory. Verse 15, and David had a craving this particular day and he said, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So he's in battle. The enemy has got the town of Bethlehem and Bethlehem is significant to David because that's where he was born and raised. It means the bread basket is what it actually means. And David said, oh, I'm parched for water, a drink of water, verse 16. So his three mighty men, the one we talked about, forced their way into the camp of the Philistines. And they drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and carried it and brought it back to David. I mean, these guys were crazy. <laughs> these guys were just crazy. All he said was, ooh, I'd love to drink the water in that well. And they go, no worries, my king. And they get up and they kill the enemy and they draw up the bucket, and they get a cup and they bring it back to him. My goodness, these guys have faith and confidence. So the Bible says, yet David could not drink it. So he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. He says, I'm not worthy. These men's courage, these men's strength, I'm not worthy. And he poured it out. And he said, verse 17, far be it from me, Lord, that I would do this. Should I drink the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives so he would not drink it? Verse 18, now Abishai, the brother of Joab, he was the oldest. Abishai is the oldest one of three sons of David's sister, Zariah. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, Joab was the second son, was chief of the 30 and he swung his spear against 300 and killed them. Then there was Benaiah, when I was preaching in, in China sometimes teaching, when I got Benaiah, and the interpreter got Benaiah. Do you remember that, Sandra? Uh, trying to say the word in Chinese when we're over there. Anyhow, that was another day. Then Benaiah, the son of Jehadiah, okay, had a name as well as the three mighty men, and David appointed him of his bodyguard. Now, the very name Benaiah means Yahweh, it means God, and I love that area. And uh, it means Yahweh builds, God builds. That's what the name means, God builds, Benaiah. And I love the passage of Scripture, which is, I've preached a series on it, from 1 Chronicles 11, verse 22. And it talks about how Benaiah had killed the two top chief Moabite warriors, how Benaiah had killed the Egyptian giant, and how Benaiah went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. So this guy was, just had a reputation. I could think of his mama saying, where are you going, son? Just out for a walk. 
you know, and he goes down, and what'd you do? Well, there was this pit, and there was this line, and it was snowing, and it was slipping everywhere, but I killed that baby. Well, what, what else did you do today? Well, I was out there, and these two big warriors from Moab came out, and they came out with their swords and their clubs. What'd you I, I slew them. And then he says, I never, what'd you do? He said, well, there's this giant. You know that Egyptian warrior, that giant? Yeah, yeah, well, I put him down too. No wonder David put him in charge of his bodyguard, and Solomon would later on put him in charge of the entire army. He's quite a dude. I just love reading about him. Then the Bible talks in verse 24 about Ashiel. Now, Ashiel is the youngest uh, of the three boys of um, David's sister. And uh, his very name means, uh, my light is Yahweh. And he is the brother of Joab and everything else. He was among the 30 and he was very agile. He was like a gazelle, they said he could run. And when David was trying to reconcile uh, Judah and Israel together, and uh, when one of Saul's sons was king over that particular territory, there was a commander of the army of Israel called Abner. And uh, Abner had done battle against David's men under Joab and Abner's men were losing. And so they left and Abner was running away. But this young fellow, Ashiel, Joab's younger brother, ran after him. And uh, Abner knew he was catching up. And he said to Ashiel, stop chasing me. You're on your own, I'll kill you. But he wouldn't stop. And then Joab with his spear plunged backwards and killed him. And then of course, it went into this whole free fall where Joab wanted revenge and he would through deceit kill Abner. So it goes on. And then there is Uriah. This is the saddest part. Uriah the Hittite, okay? And this is, this is really stirring. But we know that the Hittite is a land of the Canaanites. And we know that the call of God, even in the Old Testament, the same as today, is to win the nations, bring them to the light. And uh, when you look up the interpretation of Uriah the Hittite, uh, some will say, well, he resembled a Canaanite, but we know by heritage that he was a Canaanite who had converted. And we know that he converted because the name Uriah means my light is Yahweh, my light is Yahweh. So we knew that he'd converted by taking the name uh, Uriah, my light is, is, is Yahweh. So these are just some of the mighty men that I see there. When I, I think of these things, being relative towards the New Testament, I think of Ephesians 6 verse 13, and I'm sure that we are common with it, but I wanna read it from a translation perhaps that you're uncommon with, it's called the Weymouth translation, W-E-Y-M-O-U-T-H. And it puts it like this, therefore put on the complete armor of God. You notice the key word there, complete. See the problem is these days is that we partially dress for God, but not fully. We partially dress. But it says, put on the complete armour. Other translations say, put on the full armour of God so that you may be able to stand. See, the reason why so many Christians can't stand is because we're not clothed complete. The reason why we stumble, the reason why we lose our faith, the reason why we give in to attack is because we don't clothe ourselves complete in the armour of God. That's what it says here. Put on the complete armour of God so that you may be able to stand your ground in the evil day. When I see Christians cave in, when I saw Christians cave in and get caught up with controversies in COVID, when I see Christians cave in, it's because they weren't putting on the full armour of God. They had part of it, but not full of it. How do I know? Because they couldn't stand their ground in the day of evil. And having fought to the end to remain in the field. So the Bible says, I put on the armour not to get out of the field, but to stand in the field. To stand in the field. Today, the Christian stands in the name of the Lord wherever they are, wherever you are. You don't turn the light off when you're in your workplace. You don't turn the light off when you fill your car with petrol. You don't turn your light off when you go to that wedding. You don't turn the light off uh, when you go to that party. You don't turn the light off when you're alone with your friend. You don't turn the light off. You are a Christian, period, or you're not. We don't stand alone. We are a part of a great army. There are Christians who I have never met, who I perhaps will never met into eternity, who are around this world at the same time as me, but I'll never meet them. But we are still one in Christ because we're not defined by a denomination or a church. We're not defined by a race. We're not defined by a gender. We are Christians if we believe in the name of Jesus and call upon His name. And the triumph of the church depends on the personal victory of every Christian. We're only as strong as our weakest link. I don't understand why Christians pray for the downfall of another Christian. 
I don't understand why Christians pray for a pastor or church to fall. Now, there are churches and there are pastors and there are things that I don't understand, I don't comprehend. In fact, I don't follow. But I don't pray against them. I leave them in God's hands. I leave them in God's hands. That's God's area, not my area. That's God's area. My job is to advance the kingdom. My job is not to fight the kingdom. The answer for today is not more money. It's not more equipment. It's not more people. It's in God's people being dedicated. It's in God's people being committed. And there is an abandonment to God. In other words, to sanctify, which means to set myself apart to God and His Word. Now, at this point in the story of David, as I've been sharing, I want us to understand how he is coming to a high or he's in this place. I've been showing him lately how he went through these lows of betrayal and how he came back in and how he was looking to be restored by his people. And even though that David for a time was rejected, in this part of the story, we find out that he is back in his position as king and he's administering his kingdom. In 2 Samuel 23, he has listed the names of the men who stood with him through thick and thin, men who identified with him at any cost. And it's these three men that I wanna mention here with purpose. At Dino, the Bible says here that he slew 800 of the enemy on his own, 2 Samuel 23, verse eight. Eliza, it says here, who when the people of God were en route, running and were confused, he defied the Philistines to the point of complete weariness until when the battle was over, he could not let go of the sword because it was like it was welded. 2 Samuel 23, nine to 10. There's Shema. He stood his ground against an attack of the enemy. He defended it and he slew the Philistines. 2 Samuel 23, verse 11. Now I want you to understand that in each of these three cases, these guys had the victory against overwhelming odds. When you find the odds against you seem overwhelming, you probably think, God, why are you deserting me? But God says, this is the pattern of what I do. I have my people stand against overwhelming odds. Whether it be David against a giant, whether it be Shema against the multitude, whatever it is, I have them standing against overwhelming odds. Whether it be Daniel in the lion's den, whether it be Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be thrown in a fiery furnace, whether it be Esther, that if she went into the king, she could be killed without being called. The situation is that the Christians often find themselves in what is best called overwhelming odds. Why? Because God works best when it seems impossible. There was victory in the face of utter exhaustion. There was victory when the people of God were in confusion and retreated and left them on their own. Victory that was won only because of the power of God that no man should get the praise. But these stories should not simply be Old Testament stories, but rather these should be experiences that we draw upon for our own spiritual battle, for our own lives in this day. In order for me to reinforce this truth, I want to draw upon what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul was writing to the Christians of his day and he was telling them about a position that they must maintain. The very words that Paul uses this, that you may be able to stand. My prayer for each and every one of us today is that you may be able to stand you may be able to stand, no matter what the odds are, no matter what the circumstances are, that you may be able to understand, but you may be able to stand. In other words, where I am in the will of God in my circumstances, can I stand my ground? Now, I don't know what your circumstances is. I don't know how things are affecting you, physically, spiritually, financially, relationally, emotionally, I don't know. But the question is, are you standing your ground? See, the problem is we get so caught up in the emotions of the circumstances that we're not standing our ground. See, the power of the cross in someone's life puts them on their feet. And when God puts you on your feet, then he enables you to stand in days of evil. Without God, without salvation, We are helpless. But our God has come to lift us up upon the one who is called upon never to flinch, to enable us to stand firm in the midst of our adversaries. This is the position that God wants us to maintain. 
The question is, are we standing our ground against the enemy of our souls? Now, souls is our emotions. That's psyche in the Greek. That's our emotions. How are your emotions standing? I know some people, God bless them, good people, they get so emotional, they won't talk to you for a week or two weeks. Good people, love Jesus, they won't talk. But what that tells me is they have no control of their psyche, their emotions in God. Because that's not what we do. And this is best illustrated in the life of Shema, which means present, who in the midst of a Philistine raid, when the people of God were running from the enemy, he stood the ground. He defied not only the odd, but he defied the enemy. The, his own people ran away, turned their back, but he said, I will not leave this field. And the enemy advanced and said, you fool. And that's what the world says, you fool. You might think, I am a fool standing firm, but here's the key, right? Here's the key. They don't see with spiritual eyes. When Elisha seemed to be encircled by the enemy and his servant was overwhelmed with fear and the servant said to Elisha, what's happening? Elisha said, open his eyes, Lord. And when his eyes were opened, he could see what Elisha saw, an angelic army surrounding the armies of Israel. You see, you have to believe in a God who is greater than or bigger than. What's the ultimate thing this world can take? My life. The problem is we're so scared of death. We're so scared of dying. We get saved so we can have peace, but we live in more fear of death. When we get saved, we're supposed to lay our lives down. Ephesians 6 says, not only that we must stand our ground, but we must wrestle. Now, Ephesians 6, 12 says what? For we wrestle what? Not against flesh and blood. It doesn't say we don't wrestle. The Bible doesn't say we don't wrestle. But Ephesians 6, 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, you hear me? But against what? Spiritual principles of power. Which means if we're a Christian, we're gonna do some wrestling. But the wrestle is not meant to be flesh and blood, it's spiritual principalities. How do we do that? We get on our knees, we cry out to God, we come to the house of the Lord, we learn to pray and get into the Word. We wrestle, we deny our flesh so that we can open our spirit and we wrestle in these areas. The problem is, is that we don't wanna wrestle. Ephesians 6, 12 warns us about how we are called to wrestle. Every man, every woman of God is engaged somehow in the depth of soul in a battle. I'm in a battle. You're in a battle. Every single one of us is in a battle. You going through a battle? Nah, you're a liar. Everybody has a battle. You just walk out the door, you have a battle. You being in church, listen to me preach, might be a battle, okay? But there's a battle going on. There's a battle going on. And we have to learn to fight with everything we possess in Christ just to maintain our stand. It's so easy for Christians somehow to avoid the sense of battle and conflict and take ease or to say, no brother, I, I just, no, I, I, I'm just not gonna fight today. I'm just too tired. I, I'm not doing it. In the book of Amos 6 verse one, it says, woe to those who are carefree in Zion. In other words, what Amos says here is those of you who are in God's land who decided not to defend or fight aren't walking in God. There is a battle. Well, when do I rest, brother? When he calls me home. That's when there's rest, when he calls me home. When he calls me home. I'm 60. I turned 60 last October, so I suppose I'm in my 61st year, moving towards the 61. But I know I'm in a fight. I'm in a fight and it's not flesh and blood, it's spiritual. And just as I need to train my body, I've got to train my spirit. And I train my body and I train my spirit by taking control of my soul. 
My soul, my psyche, my emotions try to control my physical exercise. You don't feel like doing it today, do you? And it tries to deal with my spiritual battle by saying, can't we just have a break for a while? That's my soul, that's my psyche. My soul, my psyche is always trying to dominate what I'm meant to do. But I'm called to dominate it. I'm called to bring it under control. Many of us have become so occupied with things of this world, with our work and things and so on and so on, so on that we just like, I don't have time. I marvel. How do I explain this so it's not offensive? I don't know how I can. Okay, but uh, I don't mean to offend. You shame? No, you're all right. I understand the pressure of debt. But so many people put themselves under the pressure of debt. Now, I'm not talking about how we go to, but live more simple. Live more simple. In this season, live more simple. As a consumer, our appetite is the worst that's ever been in history. I mean, back when I was a kid, I never heard of people going to coffee shops having coffee. The only co- the first time I ever saw one of those <laughs> coffee, cup, cappuccino machines was at an Italian pizza place uh, hey. in Mount Cravat. It was called Tony's Pizza. Hey. Huh? That was the only time. Besides that, it was on George Street in the city. I'd never seen these machines. These frothy milk ones. The only milk coffee I ever had as a, when I went to work as a kid was so we'd, we'd get instant coffee, put it in a cup and we'd get a, a cup of, of, of milk and we'd put it in a saucepan and put it on the stove and heat it up and then pour it into the cup and that was milk coffee. Does anybody remember those days? <laughs> There's no chocolate sprinkles and there's no little love heart on it. That's just the way it is. So uh, that's what happens. But we have such an insatiable appetite for things. I remember as a young fella, our favourite store was the secondhand jeans stores, secondhand bookstores, comic books. They used to be coming down on a, a Station Road at Woodridge. There used to be a guy. There was a barber. He had red hair in Bobapol, but he. I think he made more money uh, out of all those comics. You know what I mean? We used to go in the back there and read all the secondhand comics that used to be there. This isn't the days. But I'm just talking about this insatiable appetite that we have today for things. I mean, we talk about green today. We were more green in those days. We didn't know it. My first job was sacking groceries. Guess what? There were paper bags. You know what's good? They didn't charge you for paper bags. They charge you for paper bags today, Danny. They didn't charge you for paper bags when I was a kid sacking groceries. We used to double bag it even because of the milk. When we went to get takeaway food, it was either butcher's paper or newspaper with a bit of grease paper, wasn't it? There was no styrofoam. The first time I ever saw styrofoam was when the first Hungry Jacks opened near us. And that was at where God City Shopping Centre, or whatever they call it now, was. There was, there was a, it's gone now, but that's where it was before Mickey D's went in down the road. It was styrofoam. Never saw styrofoam. We, we had paper straws before paper straws was being responsible. Used to hate them then like we hate them now because they always fall apart in the end. Just hated them, okay? Just hated them, didn't we, Shane? Our milkshake cups were made of wax paper. We were more environmental. Even when it came to electricity, we only had one TV and it was black and white. And the remote control was dad throwing a shoe at us and telling us to turn the channel. That was the remote control. Boom, hey, dad, turn the channel. Never ran out of batteries. Carbon dioxide, we only had one car. That's how it was. We worked on the gold section. There was no credit those days. No credit cards. We were more environmentally friendly than ever. But we have got to understand that this world is looking to condition us and rob us, but we still have to show responsibility. Ephesians 6, 13 says, therefore take up the whole arm of God, the full arm of God, so that you'll be able to resist the e- on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Let's go through this. Number one. The belt of truth. I know you know it, but I'm going to try and share some different highlights here. 
When it talks about the belt of truth, it's telling you that a man or woman's strength comes from their character of godliness and truthfulness. You can say you put on the belt of truth, but if you're not godly and truthful, you haven't got it on. It's not clicked. I've never seen so many Christians lie like they are today. Christians are lying like there's no tomorrow. Christians are just telling stories on each other. We, we say things that we shouldn't be saying. Or if we want to say it, we should say it to the person. And then when you correct them, they get cranky and just tell somebody else. Don't they ever read 1 Corinthians 10, 6 to 10? It talks about the five sins that stop them from going to the maximum potential. One of them was murmuring. Friends, murmuring, fibbing, or you entertaining it. I said to this one person, three people have come to me and tell, you, tell me, but you've got to be careful on your words. The person was hurt, we understand that. You know what they did when they left me? And I was trying to help them. They rang those people up and got stuck on saying, you broke my confidence. So they find somebody else to remember to. No, the person's hurting, I get it. But you know what it's doing? It's robbing them of reaching their maximum potential. They're still saved, they're still born again, they still love Jesus, but they're in a pit. They're in a pit because they're not breaking that cycle. See, the belt is for those who walk with a character of godliness and truthfulness. You might think you have it, but it's not clicked on. Therefore, you can't hang the sword. The breastplate of righteousness. This means a conscience that is void of offense. If you're in church and you're offended by a brother or a sister, you're offended of me, whoever else, that means you don't have the breastplate of righteousness. That means your heart is not protected. You cannot be an effective Christian with offense. That means the breastplate is not on. The shoes of peace. If you want peace, if you want to walk in peace, if you want to bring peace, then you're going to have to be at peace with God's word, not offended by the truth of God's word. The shield of faith. And we know that when Paul wrote this, he was alluding to the Romans' armour, which was a shield that would be as high as a head and as low as a feet so he could get behind. And that's what God has with faith. Faith is meant to be something you can be completely behind. The helmet of salvation. We need our minds protected. We have to take charge of what we entertain. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to pat this will, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The sword of the spirit, which is the only offensive word, is the only thing we have to cut down. And the Bible says is that with the word we cut down. If God is for us, you can be against us. And all these things are more than conquerors. I can run through a troop and leap over a wall in the name of Jesus. Greater is he that is in me than he's in this world. These are all offensive weapons. And as you know so well, there's only one part of the body that Paul doesn't say is covered. That's our back. We're not called to turn and run. When you turn your back, then you're open for attack. That's what God says. God's Word is not there to protect our backs. The problem today in the body of Christ is not that the enemy is getting behind us to attack us. The problem is Christians are behind each other attacking them in the back. The Bible says the armour is here to protect me from the frontal attack of the enemy. Regrettably, our backs are vulnerable for attack, but it's by other Christians. We've got to stop attacking each other. We've got to stop murmuring, entertaining the murmuring. Somebody said to me, a couple, or a couple of them said to me, Pastor, you know, I'm not a gossip, but I keep hearing these things. I said, I got news for you, you're a gossip. <laughs> but I'm not a gossip. But what's a gossip? People who say things. Gossip's also people who entertain things. You see, we gotta love people to say, hey, you gotta stop that. You need to walk to the cross. You gotta stop it. You need to go to the person. You gotta stop that. You gotta be different. And when someone says, you gotta stop that behavior, they go, well, I'll find somebody else. Could you imagine if all of us said, let's stop this behavior. Let's go to the cross. Let's stop this behavior. Let's go to the cross. You know what happened? The person would stop. See, that's the problem. We're letting each other down. We say we love each other, but we don't. 
we don't. Look, time is getting away and I, and I had the same problem the last service and I've got the same problem this service and somehow I, I, I lived under a false hope that I would get through more on this service than I did the last service, but obviously I don't know what I'm talking about, okay? But let me finish with this. People might think that putting on the armor of God is separate to being a Christian. Okay, I can be a Christian, but I may not put on the armor of God, but it's okay. Well, then you don't understand the word. In the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 14, Paul says this, but put on, say put on. Who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Put on. Friends, John 1, 1 says, Jesus is the Word. The beginning of the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. The armour is the Word. We have to put on the armour. The armour is Christ. I want to encourage you today to encourage yourselves to get ready to be prepared and be able. The number one thing you have to do is bring your psyche, your soul into subjection to the Spirit. You've got to get it under control. As David spoke in Psalm 42, he says, why are you so downcast on my soul? He begins to take authority over his soul, his psyche. He begins to take authority over his emotions because his emotions were spiraling him down until he speaks in Psalm 41, you can read in Psalm 41 as well. And he says, oh my soul, why are you so downcast? He's talking about the depression. Why are you so downcast? Then he speaks to his soul and he says, put your hope in the Lord. Now I love this. It's one of my favourite chapters is Psalm 42. But I love this because I can see him taking authority over his soul. You see, the soul is so in touch with its emotions. It's so in touch with its sensitivities. It's so in touch with its feelings. But it'll be contrary to God's Word. Because God's Word says, stand your ground. It doesn't say advance, because there are times we can't even advance. Anyone been in that place? There's times where I just take out my shield of faith and I go, boom, I put it down in the ground, dig into the dirt, and I push my toes up, pull my head down, and I just get behind it. And I can feel my soul say, and how long are you here for? And I go, as long as it takes. As long, and I can feel this thump, 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 thump. It's the fiery darts of the enemy, thump. Thump. Some goes over my head, some is in the ground, some goes by my side, but here's thump, 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 and I can feel it pulsating on the shield of faith. I can feel it, it's pulsating. Thump, 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 thump. And I look to the right, I look to the left. I look behind. There. Hey, it seems like I'm by myself. And they said, Well, that plot of field you're defending, uh, it's not really worth that much. Or that plot of field you're defending, yeah, we can fall back. Or that plot of field you're defending, it doesn't have value. But I'm behind the shield. Thump, thump, thump. I'm saying, not in God's eyes. While well, my left arm is embracing the shield, you see. And while I'm behind the armour, my right hand, well, it's got the sword. Every now and then, I jab out. I jab over. I jab around. It's the sword of God's promises. It's the sword of God's Word. Hebrews 4.12 says, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any other sword. It separates flesh and spirit. And it's not because of who I am, it's because who I am standing on. I'm standing on the Word and the Word is Jesus. The Word of God is the same yesterday, today, forever. And just as Joshua looked out and he saw Jericho, and he goes, oh, what a huge city. But I gotta take it first. And as he's contemplating the battle, as he's contemplating, he sees this warrior who's armed with a sword drawn. 
And straight away, Joshua goes into defensive mechanism and he pulls out his sword. Are you for me or are you against me? And he says, neither. I am the captain of the host. Joshua puts down his sword and bends his knee. The Lord says, arise, go forward. You don't have to do the battle on your own. You don't have to do the battle in your own strength. Because the captain of the host is as real to Joshua as it is to you and I. He will battle for us. Hold on to the shield of faith. Can you bow your heads? If you say to me, Sean, uh, there's areas of my life that I need victory. Would you stand up right now? There's an area right now where the enemy has been penetrating my armor. There's areas right now where I need breakthrough. Would you stand up right now in Jesus' name? Let's come in agreement for you in the name of the Lord. Whatever it is, stand up in faith. Let's believe together. If you're online right now, whatever it is, if there's areas where you need God to, to just reinforce, to strengthen, if there's areas you need God just to fortify you and strengthen you, if there's areas you need God to just equip you, stand to your faith right now. Is the belt buckle clicked in? Is the helmet strapped on? Is the breastplate in its right position? Are the shoes on your feet? <laughs> is the shield ready? Is the sword ready? Father, in the name of Jesus, I come in agreement with friends. In the same way, Lord, I look to my own self. I wanna click in or tighten up that belt. I wanna make sure, Lord, that the breastplate is in place. I wanna make sure that helmet is strapped on. I wanna make sure, Lord, my feet uh, are in those shoes. I want to make sure the shield is in position and ready. I want to make sure my hand is on the sword of your word because I'm in warfare right now and I'm doing battle. I'm not doing battle against a brother or sister. I'm not doing battle against the government or its taxes. I'm not doing a battle against money in the flesh. I'm doing battle in the spirit. I'm going to wrestle just like Jacob wrestled the Lord, uh, but he got a dislocated hip. I'm wrestling this world and I know, Almighty God, that you have equipped me to do it, Lord. God, it may well mean we just stand our ground, then stand your ground, friend. Stand your ground. In the name of Jesus, in the power and authority that you invested in me, Almighty God, as a servant of the living King, I speak blessings and favour and strength, the animus power, explosive dynamite power over these men and women in the name of Jesus. We are not under condemnation. We're not under judgment. We're under the grace of God. And under the grace of God, we speak e being equipped. We let go of any offensive way. We let go of any irritation. We let go of any murmuring. We let go of our psyche, our soul that tries to dictate over us. And we speak the name of Jesus. Jesus right now. You can be seated. If you don't know the Lord, if you're away from the Lord, if you're online right now in the mainstream or here right now and you don't know Jesus, then say this prayer. Say, Jesus. Say it. Jesus, I invite You into my heart, my life right now. I repent of all my sins and wrong by the confession of my mouth, by faith of my heart. I make it known I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, if you prayed this prayer to rededicate your life, if you prayed this prayer because you want to be a Christian, would you raise your hand right now? If you prayed this prayer to know Jesus, raise your hand. If you prayed this prayer to know the Lord, if you're on the live stream, this little pop-up comes right now. If you prayed this prayer, I'll be at the back after the service, come and see me and I'll come in agreement with you in the name of the Lord.